Great, thanks Mick. Um, thanks uh, everyone for coming along and showing your interest um, in what is one of the, the key social issues at the moment in Ireland. Um, just to, I suppose, follow on, what I'm going to do today is to try and give an overview um, from both an academic perspective but also policy analysis, policy analysts um, of housing, the, the housing crisis at the moment in Ireland. And obviously the housing crisis is massive, it's got so many different parts to it. So at a certain amount I'm going to run through quickly some things. Um, I know some of you will know this inside out um, and some of you might be new so I was kind of thinking how I might balance. So apologies to those um, who some of this will be very familiar to you. Um, and within running through my, um, my research and presentation and the work that I have done is a critical analysis of the housing system and housing policy in Ireland, um, which I believe is in need for, of fundamental reform. Um, and I, the title I put on this was Understanding the Housing Crisis, and then I actually put in Hi Irish Housing System, because my argument is that this crisis is not just a once-off crisis, but a continuation of fundamental problems within the Irish housing system. Um, and then I'm going to look at some solutions, and it is within the frame of a political economy analysis. Um, so the three kind of parts of the, the presentation that I hope to, to cover, there's lots and lots of slides in here that I won't get near, but they'll be available on the website, so you can look through them in your own time. Um, the first thing is the housing crisis, and what is the nature of that crisis, and particularly looking at the social impacts. The second thing is the causes, and I make the case that the current housing crisis is largely as a result of um, the austerity policies that were pursued through from 2008 onwards, but also the way in which um, governments responded to that crash um, and the initial housing um, crisis of, you know, the, of the 2000s that was um, burying. But it also links back to wider processes of financialization globally and um, housing policy, which has been largely neoliberal in Ireland. Um, for a number of decades. The final thing that I'll go to is these solutions and really it's around using a human rights um, and social justice frame or a frame which would shift housing from being predominantly a commodity to one that is a social good. So in terms of who is actually most affected by the crisis, um, you know, if we look at the, there's a, a growing number of groups and individuals who are affected, affected by the housing crisis in Ireland now. There's renters who are facing high rents and the stories at the moment of people actually um, engaging in bidding wars between renters at the moment in Dublin to try and get um, somewhere to live. Young people and families or others who are unable to buy a home due to rising house prices and the lack of um, lending and incomes and um, affordability issues. There's the people in mortgage arrears and mortgage distress, which I will go on to. Um, the housing waiting lists, people who are homeless, travellers in direct, um, travellers in substandard accommodation and direct provision, and also what have really uh, gone out of the attention is stalled and collapsed regeneration projects in our most disadvantaged um, areas across the country. And in terms of appreciating the scale of the crisis, we are in, in particularly in terms of housing need, we are in an unprecedented level of um, need in comparison to what has existed over the last number of decades in Ireland. This is the housing waiting list. Um, in 2013, it was just under 90,000. Other figures put out by Fianna Fáil um, in the last few months have suggested that the figures are closer to 110,000, but local authorities argue that that's a, a issue of doubling up of numbers. But irrespective, we can see here the significant increase of those in housing need on the housing waiting list, local authority waiting lists, over the last number of years, and particularly during the crisis years. Um, but also what this is pointing out, this figure here in 2005, is that there was still a substantial number um, of households in requirement of housing need at the height of the boom. Where do these people live? Um, the majority of, the li of them live in private rented accommodation. Um, a majority are dependent on rent supplement. But if we look through in terms of you know, people who are um, on this housing waiting list, there is issues of disability, and been able to un been unable to afford the accommodation, and issues of overcrowding. This was analysis I put together of the figures breaking it down per local authority area and looking at the geography of the housing crisis in Ireland. 
And I would uh, make the case running through this that Dublin is really, uh, Dublin and the commuter counties around it are really where the, the housing crisis is most intense and most severe and it is at a scale beyond anything in the other parts of the country. Um, if we look at the actual numbers, you know, 31,000 on the waiting list in Dublin, um, we see rental prices there, these are 2000 and it was, I did it last, 2014 figures. Rents, um, average rents up to 1400, um, increasing by 14%. And then I put in there um, the projected increases based on the housing agency analysis of household formation. Um, and Dublin is the highest where new households are coming on board and this is the, the requirement for housing. Um, Cork is next then, about a third of the amount of housing, uh, those on that waiting list. And um, we see rents here significantly lower than they are in Dublin. Um, then Kildare is next, a commuter county around Dublin. Um, Galway is next. Then we've Kerry here, which is surprising, but that is because there's a very high um, waiting list in Kerry in terms of housing need. And then we've got other counties, but we see here the numbers fall significantly. So again, the case, and we see the rents as well um, falling, but Wicklow is an outlier here. Again, a commuter county, rents been significantly high. Um, in Wicklow, but it's interesting to look at that. Um, the, and the issue, of course, of homelessness, which has really emerged um, since kind of mid-2014, early 2014, um, as a major social crisis. And the numbers are really staggering when we look at the increase, um, particularly in children with families who are homeless and who have become homeless, and these are the figures for Dublin. And again, this is largely a Dublin and the commuter counties phenomenon. Um, even though it's not completely, but in terms of the scale of it. Um, we're now at, in January, um, 1,500 children um, who are in emergency accommodation in Dublin. And what was significant in that is that there was a decrease in the number of families becoming homeless in December, down to, it was it went dropped, I think, to around 75. But then that substantially increased to 165 in January, just gone. So this sense that was the crisis abating, um, is clearly not the case. Um, these are images from, um, this was quite a thought, quite a, um, a symbolic and, um, situation was there's 14 families who were be being made homeless from a hostel, which is their emergency accommodation because they've already been homeless, in Mountjoy Square in Dublin. Um, this is some of them at the, in the city council offices. The children they've been trying to protest around actually not being evicted from a hostel and emergency accommodation, um, and this took place on the day of the election. In terms of understanding then, you know, the Irish housing system, this is work, this is from NESC, um, this is analysis of, you know, what's happening to Ireland. The significant trends are really the, the increase in private renting and reliance on private renting, um, the private rental sector, and the drop in home ownership. In 1991, 80% um, of households um, owned their home in Ireland. That has now dropped to 70% and has probably dropped further since then. Um, and this increase in private renting over doubling 8% um, of 10 years, 8% of households to now almost a fifth of all households are in the rented, um, the private rented sector. The other significant change over time has been the drop in local authority housing from almost a fifth of housing in 1961 to around 9% um, in 2011. Um, and the real sort of housing crisis, in a way, is this within the private rented sector. Um, and it sort of is, is spilling over into lots of other areas. And of course, it comes from these different factors um, leading to it. One of them, and one of the other interesting trends, again, this is from NESC, um, is this decline in home ownership amongst lower income households. And if we look at it, we can see that um, in terms, this is a percentage of heads of households who are owner-occupiers by social class. So if we look in 1991, um, there was, amongst the semi-skilled um, class, they were, there was 77% were homeowners. But we see this declining to 63% in 2011. And then the unskilled social class, home ownership dropping from 64% to 49%. Now there's an age factor in there as well, but it does show this decline in home ownership amongst lower income groups. And again, this is due to the, the reduction in social housing and particularly the availability to buy of social housing. And um, that shows the same thing. <coughs>
So the case is really that the private rented sector has become essential to the housing system in Ireland. And so what goes on in the private rented sector is really important. And it's particularly important for lower income groups because of the inability to buy their home, but also people, younger people, who are unable to, um, to buy their home as well. Um, and within this, we're seeing the importance of private rented, the private rented sector for social housing in that a third of the sector is now being subsidized to some extent by, um, by the state, as in it's providing some form of social housing. And between the various forms of um, government support to those on low incomes, we're roughly paying about half a billion a year now to the private rented sector, private landlords. So what's happening then in terms of rents, you're well aware these are the trends of rent significantly rising over 2013, 14 and 15 back in Dublin, um, all, almost to, um, they are back in Dublin, sorry Dublin here, to um, pre-crisis levels of rents. The, there's a major issue of supply of housing this, within the rental sector, this is the collapse um, of supply of rental accommodation. Interesting to look at the, um, the research done by um, the PRTB, the Private Rented um, Tenancy Board, around why people are still in the private rented sector. And we see here the reasons why tenants are renting a significant proportion is it because it's because they can't get a mortgage, they're not earning enough, um, or they can't find a suitable property to buy. And if we look at why tenants are saying they prefer to own their home rather than rent, um, 65% say the most important thing is to decorate and furnish their own home. They would prefer to purchase their home as just a statement. No security with renting, 54%. The investment is property being investment, 49%. Something to pass to the next generation, 41%. Um, and not suitable for family living, 24%. But what is significant is the lack of security with renting is actually more important than it being an investment, which is something to think about in terms of our changing housing system. Um, these are further. You know. The affordability of rent then has become a major issue. A single person average earnings um, would be allocating between 40% and in some cases up to 55% of their income on rent now. Um, a sustainable rent is considered to be about 30% of your rent. This then is the issue of rent supplement. So that's what um, people who are on lower incomes and um, who aren't able to afford accommodation get to live in the, get if they're living in the private rented sector. The rent supplement for Dublin for a couple, um, a couple with one child is 850 euros. The average rent in the north of Dublin city is 1,300 euro. So these are people who are on very low incomes or reliant on social welfare are expected to find up to 500 euros per month as a top up and this is what is really in many ways the uh, the NGOs in particular housing NGOs are arguing is causing homelessness this gap between the rent supplement and the rent is forcing people um, into homelessness particularly those those on low incomes um, the in terms of again this is back to the case about Dublin that really this is a Dublin crisis if we look at where the majority of rental properties are over 40% of rental properties in the country are in Dublin um, then the Mideast is about 19%, so between the Mideast, which you would put um, as the kind of the um, commuter counties and Dublin, you've got 60%. It's a Dublin and the commuter counties um, is where the renting is. This is the, again, if we look at where is the, you know, there's a talk about housing supply and demand, and there's going to be in this demand for increased housing. The overwhelming majority of it is in Dublin. So there is this, this crisis within the private rented sector, um, which as I've said, that, that higher rents are resulting in people becoming homeless. Also, the um, people are becoming homeless because of the issue of the, um, the repossession of buy-to-let properties, which I'll come on to a little bit. But I made a quite, it, it's a bit of a facetious point, but um, the, the mantra is that rents are rising because supply is being, uh, is, is, falling significantly, the lack of supply of rental accommodation. But rents increase because landlords increase them. It's as simple as that. Um, if there was rent controls in place, or rent certainty, landlords would not be able to increase the rents. Um, and it is a point that I think needs to be made more. Um, 
There is an issue as well in terms of looking at the economic impact of the housing crisis. The, the housing crisis is really starting to impact, I would argue, on our economic development and our competitiveness, particularly in terms of returning emigrants talk a lot about the cost of housing in Ireland as a reason why they're not returning. Um, people are not able to take up employment in Dublin because of the high, rent, uh, the high housing costs, but also then it is pushing for people to require higher wages. There's obviously impacts in terms of people on deprivation, um, pushing people into deprivation, but the housing crisis is having an impact on our economic development at this point. Um, I'm going to move on. These are how I afford. The, what I want to talk about is, and I, I weave this within the in it, is that what happened in Ireland has happened is, is part of a global um, process, particularly in the US, um, is, is this process of financialization of home ownership and commodification of housing and the way in which housing um, and property has become integrated into the accumulation of capital, the accumulation of wealth globally as a key method of accumulating wealth. Um, and really this started or you know, accelerated with the rise of neoliberalism, the deregulation of the financial markets in the 1980s and has accelerated and is part of this rise of the global financial system. Um, and David Harvey would argue, um, the economic geographer um, and Marxist would argue that housing has become a key area in which the crisis within capitalism and um, the decline in the profitability issues, the lack of um, a return to capital from investing in the real economy, housing has become a key area where, and property, where capital can get a return and a higher return. Um, and he calls it this sort of uh, spatialization of the, the crisis within capitalism. Um, but of course, again, a contradiction within this is as housing has become, and property has become more financialized, it has led to a problem of indebtedness. Um, and this also feeds into that theory that um, the reduction in wages of workers in the Western world and their declining labor share has meant that in order to access things like housing, they require more on, they require um, a greater reliance on the financial sector, on lending and borrowing. And really the credit fuel boom in the 2000s was in a way capitalism overcoming this problem, this gap between the demand that's coming from workers in declining wage share and the need obviously for um, markets and that the, the credit uh, filled this gap. But of course that leads to this problem of over indebtedness and when you have a crash, you really see this indebtedness um, in position. Ireland is a really good example of that. And Ireland is an example of this financialization, the way in which the, this um, residential investment letting, so housing as an investment, became a really important part of housing lending during the boom. So we see here that, um, particularly in the, in the latter stages, this rise, this is people who are buying properties to let, buying it as an investment. It all, at one point in 2007, it was almost equal, um, or sorry, it actually went above those who were first-time buyers in terms of their, I'm trying to look at the colors here, or was there, it was roughly equal to first time buyers. So as much, as much money was been given out for people to buy housing as an investment as was for people to buy their, their home for the first time. Um, and the result of this, of course, is the economic crash and then we have the mortgage arrears crisis. The mortgage arrears crisis in the dominant political narrative is one that's abating um, and really is, is essentially not a major concern. Um, and we see it is true that through 2014 and 15, the numbers of um, house, households in arrears over 90 days has reduced significantly. But I've undertaken analysis of this, um, these figures from the central bank, their um, household figures around the mortgages. And what I've found is that um, I took, first of all, took an overall look at, okay, what was the situation in terms of arrears in Ireland? And I, of all the, um, what I found was that of all the mortgages, and this is for primary dwelling homes, uh, houses, so that's not including the buy-to-let sector, um, almost 30% of housing, of households who had a mortgage for their home in Ireland went into some form of arrears during the crisis. And that's a massive proportion of um, housing distress. In Ireland, in comparison then to uh, at a European level in the crisis, we have had one of the highest levels of default, um, of arrears in uh, Europe, which again is, is very significant. And if we look at 
the, the legacy of this, again, this argument of financialization, this indebtedness, we see here, these are figures from just last year, Ireland is the fourth highest in terms of household debt as a proportion of net disposable income. And we see this legacy of the crash in terms of this huge indebtedness and legacy of financialization of housing and commodification of housing in this massive indebtedness of households. So in terms of the figures then on arrears, um, the, the, while the number in, in arrears on those in arrears over 90 days has declined, and that's the headline figure, if you drill into it, those in arrears over 720 days has increased by almost 45% in the last um, three or four years. So, and 12% of the entire residential mortgage accounts, that includes buy to lets, are still in arrears. Um, and so these are the figures showing that if we look at those in arrears on their home over 720 days, has increased from 25,000 in 2013 to, two, to 37,000 in the last quarter, third quarter of 2015. So this is almost like a hidden uh, crisis that has really not got much coverage. And I would argue that the portrayal, even by the central bank, of the mortgage arrear system of situation is, um, is uh, unfair in the way they seem to be downplaying this. And of course, there's lots of reasons why they are downplaying this. Um, if we look at even over 90 days, those arrears over 90 days, as a percentage of the total stock, it has actually increased. So in 2015, it was 5% of the mortgage stock in comparison to 2% in 2013. Um, and th the big reason why this drop in um, arrears took place in those over 90 days is this restructuring process. Um, and I found that the number of in arrears dropped by 50,000 between 2013 and 2015, while the number of restructured mortgages rose between around 40,000. So there's only 10,000 in a difference. You could argue only 10,000 actually solved their mortgage arrears situation because the restructuring includes this massive range to from what the central bank itself describes as unsustainable restructuring processes to uh, mortgage debt been added on to the end of the mortgage life, um, to reduced interest rates, to interest holidays. They're not really sustainable solutions. Um, and we see this huge increase in the number of restructuring, uh, restructured mortgages. <coughs> so we now have 120. buy to lets then is the other area. So that was primary um, dwelling homes. Um, a fifth of, which is much higher than the, the primary dwelling home, a fifth of buy to lets are still in arrears over 180 days. 11% are in arrears over 720 days. And this is really where I would argue, um, and the NGOs, housing NGOs are making the case, this is really hitting the homelessness because these properties are starting to be repossessed by the banks and tenants in those properties are being evicted essentially um, as the banks look to either sell the property or get in higher paid tenants. Repossessions then, I've put uh, the figures together for these as well. Look at what has happened in Ireland in terms of repossessions. There have been approximately 4,000 repossessions so far. Um, which is much, much lower than, for example, Spain. Um, and I would argue that there was a political decision taken to not go after, um, um, to not go after to repossess homes because of the historical connections in Ireland with repossessions. Um, but what we're seeing is that there's still, um, I've done the figures that roughly, we, you could see repossession figures five or six times this number. So up to 20, 30,000 of homes repossessed in the coming years if this proportion continues um, or if the situation accelerates. So we see a housing crisis that we think exists in terms of we see homelessness or rents. There's this whole other crisis just sitting there um, ongoing and waiting to explode as well. Um, okay, move on, Rory Mick says. Wealth in uh, housing, there's a whole load of stuff I'm not going to get. Okay, wealth in housing. This is, I'm just going to briefly run through this. Um, we're seeing here, uh, housing plays a key role in wealth, uh, in wealth distribution, and what's interesting is in Ireland that uh, housing as a, across the, te um, the income deciles, ownership of housing is much higher across the board. Um, housing wealth has increased over the last number of years due to rising hop housing uh, house prices, uh, but also financial wealth has increased as well. If we look at the share of net wealth in Ireland, the top 10% have roughly 70%, or top 20% have roughly 70% of the net wealth. Um, and this is largely due to both housing assets and financial assets. We can see here in terms of financial assets, 
again, overwhelming the top two deciles have that. Land, again, really skewed in terms of the de top deciles and wealth have land. Again, that would be a lot of agricultural land as well um, and would put people... And it's important to think that just because you're wealthy doesn't mean you automatically are what we might, we might consider rich in that you mightn't have a high income, but you could have a lot of wealth. Um, in terms of the household main residence as a proportion of your net wealth, we see here that for the top 10%, it's the highest. And so we see that housing wealth is predominantly held by the higher deciles in Ireland. So it is a, a way in which wealth inequality is worsened. Um, particularly when you look at things like who owns their home, this is analysis done by task. Um, single parents have the lowest um, level of home ownership. And in terms of wealth distribution, we see how that impacts that. Um, Interestingly, when we look at the deciles then, of the, who owns their home? 60% um, of those in the bottom two deciles own their home. 57% in the uh, second two deciles, but it goes up to 90% in the top. Um, and when we see the, the, the proportion of their housing, so housing is really important as the, fa the proportion of people's wealth in the lower deciles. In the top ones, it's not so much because they have financial assets as well. Um, so that's a slight interesting aside. The housing system in Ireland, I would argue, really entrenches structural inequalities because it is a way in which spatial segregation, the classes are spatially segregated. This is a map of deprivation, and we can see how it is very spatially concentrated. And housing is a key way in which inequality, structural inequality, is continued um, and is enforced in a way as people separate themselves according to income um, and it has lots of other factors that we don't have time to go into. Okay, why the crisis? I've in part gone into that. Um, the large case is this, um, this, I would argue, this ideological commitment amongst the Irish uh, political po and policy makers, this commitment to belief in private investment and the private market system. <laughs> Um, and the financialization of housing, housing being seen as speculative asset and investment, but also this global financialization process and the perception and belief that social housing is a failure, that um, really social housing is not something to be developed in this neoliberal view of social housing. Um, and then, as I said, that the crisis has resulted from the way in which, and I would argue that there was a displacement of the cost of the crisis onto from the banks, um, the investors, bondholders, onto the people, and they have paid that through austerity. So for example, um, if austerity, the, the social housing budgets were cut much, much more than other budgets. So I've calculated that if the austerity budgets had not happened in social housing, we would have an additional 25,000 local authority units built through the austerity period. So we can see very clearly the socialization of the cost of dealing with the crisis was put on the most vulnerable. We would not have a housing crisis if austerity was not implemented the way it was in terms of um, the cuts to local authority housing. Nothing to the degree in which we have. The other area is the way in which the contrast the debt write-offs for um, developers, for the banks, to what has happened to the mortgage arrears and those in mortgage arrears. Also NAMA. NAMA has become a key way in which the housing crisis and the economic crisis in Ireland was dealt with and solved. But all NAMA did was displace the cost of the crisis again onto Irish people and it is displacing it into the future. Because if we look at NAMA, um, and sorry, this is the, 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 what shows the collapse in local authority and um, voluntary cooperative social housing building. This is the price that was paid in austerity and I really think it, it counters the argument that austerity worked in Ireland. Um, there was political choices made in terms of who to bear the brunt, and this was one of them, and we see this crisis resulting from it. Um, this is, sorry, and in terms of, yeah, the, I won't go into that, okay. In terms of moving on, I would argue I've described it, there's a, there's a, a, a property political industrial complex in Ireland, which combines the property industry, finance, the media, um, and those who own property and significant owners of property. Um, and they really, the, the current property market um, is operated for them. 
And in terms of political economy, it's really interesting to look at the way the rising property market played a central role in the government's strategy for economic recovery. Um, and in particularly for, I would argue, the psychological sense that people were in a recovery. Um, and it's also why the in the election, I believe, that the government was rejected. Uh, housing was a key area. One of the issues was NAMA. NAMA was part key part of that. The government made the case for winding NAMA up early um, and dealing with the problem. But of course, to, to require to do that required a rising property market, which um, similarly with the banks, one of the key ways the banks were going to be fixed was if the property market continued to rise, less properties in negative equity, their balance sheets looked better. But of course, the cost of that is not dealing with the mortgage arrears crisis, and the cost, I would argue as well, was not implementing rent control. Because if they'd implemented rent control um, in a serious way and not the rent freeze, that would seriously dampen house prices. I would also argue that it's why Michael Noonan and the government have been so incensed by the central bank's mortgage rules, because they are putting a dampening on house prices as well. And that severely um, impacts on their ability to achieve these political goals that they had to show that they were um, um, achieving the recovery. The other aspect that's been interesting is NAMA, but also the REITs, the Real Estate Investment Trust, have been a way that the government and the state has promoted financialization on an ongoing basis after the crash, even despite its key role in the cause of the crash. Um, and we're seeing um, Real Estate Investment Trust coming into Ireland, buying up um, investment. And I just want to read, this is an article from the Sunday uh, Independent two weeks ago. And it just shows what's happening in terms of this financialization of Irish housing. And the, the heading is international buyers prompt surge in multifamily sales. They're not talking about sales of families. They're talking about sales of apartments, groups of apartments. Um, and it, it, it says that the appearance of big investment firms from overseas on the Irish property scene over the past few years has helped push sales of apartments to more than a tenth of the total number of property sales. So they're saying that 47,000 housing units were sold in Dublin between 2012 and 2015. Of those, 5,000 were traded in these multifamily blocks. Um, some blocks have been bought by wealthy individuals and consortia like Kennedy Wilson and Marathon Asset Management. So the Savills Director of Research commented on this and he said, corporate investors were quick to spot the mismatch between dormant construction output and continued population growth. They correctly interpreted this would lead to increases in rents and capital values and took the opportunity to buy up vacant blocks early in the recovery cycle. Um, and they're saying, so it goes on to say that, um, that the last week the IRES, which is the uh, REIT, the Real Estate Investment Trust Chief Executive, warned investors that the government's rent certainty measures would hurt the company's bottom line in the months ahead. So again, we're seeing that you know, this way in which the, uh, through NAMA and the REITs, Ireland's property and housing has been further financialized, but also the political impact in terms of influence. I know, give me a couple of minutes, okay? Um, <laughs> a couple of minutes and I'll get there. Um, the, so I've talked about that in terms of housing inequality. What's interesting, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the political fallout and impacts of the housing crisis. What's really interesting, and I would argue that housing actually played a key role, the crisis, in the rejection of the government. Um, and because it went in that frame of, if you, anybody was watching the debates, the housing issue, homelessness, was constantly pointed to as one of the reasons why the recovery wasn't really a recovery. Um, and particularly, the point was made, why should we, um, the public opposed the agenda of tax cuts been offered because they said tax cuts are crazy when we've people on the streets and that was a real sentiment and it was shown in the opinion polls and um, the this was a poll done for, by the sunday independent by millward brown and it was said ask voters what was the most important issues or problems that will influence your decision as to how you will vote health was first unemployment was next crime and order but the homeless situation lack of authority housing came in at nine percent higher than the water charges issue the next one was mortgage repayment rates and house prices was 7%. If you put 7 and 9, you get 16 together. The housing issue was actually second as an issue that was going to influence how people voted. Um, this is, on the right-hand side, is Eurobarometer, the survey I found, which looked at um, Irish people's attitudes to what they cited was the most important issue in Ireland. Housing, they cited, was the most important issue. 34% cited, unemployment was next, health and security, taxation came in at 9%. 
This is in large reason why the government's narrative of offering tax cuts didn't work, because people have seen the crisis and they're affected by it and they realise that public investment is required. Fianna Fáil, interestingly, put housing as they said, they said three core <coughs> priorities in their manifesto. The fourth was secure home ownership and tackle homelessness. It was a key issue. Um, and if you look at their, their housing, then they talk about strengthening, strengthening the right to own, but creating homes for social housing, help generation rent, which they talk about, and uh, ending long-term homelessness. Housing was a major issue. And also how that became was because there's been this emergence of grassroots housing campaigns um, and even the right to water movement, as it has evolved into right to change, has taken on the housing issue as a key issue. And the housing issue, I would argue, the crisis adding to new social movement politics in Ireland, which is related to the institutional failure to deal with these social issues um, and these examines. And in this context, I think there's an opportunity for a new government to really change a direction in terms of housing. Um, and to move it away from the property spe speculative investment model um, to one where ho housing is seen as primarily meeting people's need for a home and particularly not relying on the private market industry and speculators. And to change that policy, the state really needs to play a leading role, not just in the delivery of housing, but in coordinating and ensuring and regulating um, and particularly around strengthening tenants' rights. So ideas I have, which I don't have time to go into now, is things like a new housing and homes agency that would integrate NAMA, compulsory purchasing of land, fast-tracking fast tracking the vacant site tax, which doesn't come in until 2013, um, changing NAMA into an affordable homes agency, the lifetime of it being extended. It shouldn't be, be tried to wo uh, wound up soon. NAMA has the land and assets to provide approximately 50,000 housing units over the next eight years. That could solve our housing crisis. Um, rent controls are required, rent certainty, and increased tenants' rights. Um, and interestingly, the Constitution is often cited as why um, they, as it, that, that rent control is not possible because of the right of private ownership. But actually, the article in the Constitution that, um, this, that follows the right of private ownership states that the right to private ownership should be regulated by the principles of social justice and the state may delimit by law these rights for the common good. And I'll finish there because I think in many ways if our housing system reflected the aspirations in our constitution, we wouldn't have the housing crisis that we have today.